Hello everyone and welcome to Copper and Natter Series 3, Episode 3 with my very special guest Georgie Twig. Thank you so much for joining me, how are you? I'm good thank you, how are you? I'm good, I'm very excited. So for everyone uh, that is unaware, myself and Twiggy actually play on the same team at Surbiton and I know that this is going to be a crap of an episode so just <laughs> a heads up as we as we start things off. A an, an absolute legend in the hockey world, a Great Britain and England, absolute legend, double Olympian, um, a bronze medal in 2012, obviously that famous gold medal in Rio, as well as that, a, a world, uh, world Cup medal, European medals, Commonwealth Games medals, Twiggy has the lot, okay, and also is one of the most consistent reliable performers uh, to step foot on a hockey pitch. So I'm honestly delighted to have you uh, join me. So thank you very much. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, so to kick things off, you know that I like to start every cup and natter with the same thing in how you like your tea. Everyone wants to know how Georgie Twig likes her tea, okay? So I'm gonna do that by asking you five quick fire questions. Okay, you good to go? Yeah. All right, question one, breakfast tea or herbal tea? Controversy, Earl Grey. Okay, okay. Well, that's actually my second question. Twine in Yorkshire or Earl Grey. So that, I mean, I, I, I think you're making Cupra and Natta history right now by saying Earl Grey. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, okay. If you're not following the trend, good on you. Okay, milk, sugar or neither? Neither. Okay. W wait, what? No milk? Yeah, I have black, I have black tea. I know, it's, it's weird. <laughs> Okay, right, right. So you really do not follow the trend at all, okay? Okay, question number four. Going back a few years, which GB teammate are you most likely to share an afternoon tea with? Probably Maddie. Because I always, I used to share a room with her a lot. And so we were always, you know, I was bringing the Earl Grey and she was bringing the Yorkshire. Um, so yeah, probably Maddie. I mean, two big tea drinkers right there I'll, I'll have to make sure that Maddie might agree to your afternoon tea invite but okay question five what GB teammate are you most likely to make a cup of tea for um I mean Nick White used to also love a cup of tea like all the time so probably her because I mean, she, she needs one in her hand all the time. Yeah, okay. I mean, big tea drinkers, I get that. But um, yeah, I still can't quite believe it. We've got an Earl Grey tea, uh, tea drinker that doesn't drink any milk in that or sugar. So, I mean, yeah. I'm pleased. It's a first. <laughs> I'm very pleased. And I can tell that this is going to be a flying episode from now on. But to kick things off, I pre-warned you that I ask all of my couple and natter guests three questions. Okay, so... After making your international debut at the Champions Trophy in Nottingham in 2010, can I just add, guess who was there? <laughs> Were you a fan in the crowd? Don't you make me feel old? No, okay, guess who else was there? Alongside me, the England under-16 team, myself, Hannah Martin, Lily Mousley, <laughs> Amy Tennant, the list goes on. So. We, um, I was honoured to be there, of course, because I knew that you were going to be a cuppa and that a guest a few years down the line. Um, but as I've touched upon, you had an illustrious career since making your debut at the age of 19. But if you were to look back, what would be the main highlight or, you know, the achievement that really stands out for you during your international career? Well, I guess, obviously, the obvious answer is winning gold in Rio, which was obviously absolutely incredible and, you know, something that we've been dreaming of our whole lives and working towards um but also for me 2012 was probably equally as special um you know competing in your first olympics on home soil there was such a buzz like going into the olympics um and you know i'll never forget like the first game stepping out onto that pitch with 12,000 british fans um, it was absolutely amazing so I mean probably the most cliched answers but both, both Olympics were, were very very special. I mean I can imagine I, I don't think I'd be able to choose between the two but for yourself as you touched upon obviously London being your first Olympic Games experience and you being the youngest member of that team how did that feel did you feel a little bit of pressure you know being the the youngster in the squad in that home Olympic Games as well? Um, I 
think there was any added pressure. Um, I think obviously I was very nervous, um, you know, and, and I do remember in that first game, I think after the first, like my first stint and going onto the bench, my heart was pounding so much. And one of the more senior players was like, take a deep breath <laughs> because it was, you know, you were, I was so nervous and, um, you know, your first experience and it was nice having them one of the more experienced players to kind of give you that wise word. Um, but no, I wouldn't say there was any added pressure. Um, you just kind of put it on yourself really. Yeah. And I guess obviously the home crowd must have been, been helping those nerves, especially in that first game. But I guess like leading into London 2012, not many people would be aware, but you were actually completing your law degree at the University of Bristol. And how was that in terms of managing the commitments of both committing your, uh, completing your degree and also obviously getting selected for Team GB at 2012? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. It was, it, that sort of last six months in the build-up to London were pretty mad. Um, but to be fair, I was so lucky because... I got asked to go and sort of trial for the GB squad when I was doing my second year at uni and then got offered a place on the sort of training program um, and I was kind of coming to the end of my second year and so I had one year left of my law degree but didn't really you know and I kind of wanted to do the hockey sort of what an opportunity and um, so I spoke to the university and they were absolutely amazing they allowed me to split my final year over two years um, and then obviously that did mean though that I was then sort of finishing my final exams just before 2012 but at least it was only sort of half of the year um, and you know because I was then based at Bisham Monday to Thursday most of my stuff was recorded and I'd just go back for some tutorials on a Friday at Bristol so um, so no but to be fair I actually quite liked having the sort of the two side by side because you know both can be quite intense and so having sort of having something different to do was quite good at kind of distracting yourself and not getting caught up in in one and stressing so much about one um so definitely I think probably doing all the studies did help with the hockey and in the lead up to you know Olympic selection and things like that um I think it was probably a, a welcome distraction it's honestly unbelievable I, like, I can't quite comprehend how you know the organization and the time management that you must have had to be really on top of in those last few months of your degree because you know leading into the biggest sporting event that you can participate in is just incredible and then I guess the contrast to that for Rio four years later down the line did you feel a little bit more experienced going into that knowing that what you'd experienced at 2012? Yeah definitely I think you know you kind of know a little bit more like what to expect um you know, a, an Olympic Games is so unique compared to any other hockey tournament. Um, so, so yeah, there was definitely an element of that. But then equally, you know, I remember, I think I was more nervous for selection for Rio than I was for London. And, you know, that's obviously because the, the strength in our squad was so, was so good going into Rio. Um, and that obviously is probably one of the huge contributing factors to winning gold, gold out there. Um, so, you know, that definitely the build up to Rio was was pretty nerve wracking. And once selection was done, that was kind of a big relief, relief off my shoulders. And I think probably not having my studies maybe made me more nervous as well for that Rio selection, because it was sort of I was just doing hockey and, you know, just in that bubble. It's interesting, isn't it, how actually that added distraction may be leading into 2012 then, from the sounds of things, probably was a blessing in disguise for you. But I guess looking back yeah. at 2016 and the successes that you guys had out there, I mean, I bet everything was well and truly worthwhile in terms of all that tension and nerves that you must have felt throughout in the build-up. But obviously those two weeks in Rio, I, I want to pick your brains in terms of you had the support of your family out there and how much did that mean to you having them there witnessing and experiencing such a special event um, with you? Yeah, it was amazing. You know, I think, as you know, like all of our families have been such a huge, like part of our journeys um, getting to that point. And so it was really nice that, you know, they could all come out and, and be there for the whole time. And, and Team GB always does a fantastic job of, you know, where, where we where they have an area at the Team GB house where we could go and see our parents. Um, and, you know, and I think, yeah, it was just great to be able to celebrate with them after, after the win as well. Um, you know, because as I said, 
all of those people had been part of our journeys. And, and actually the, the funny thing was, was that as we sort of progressed out of the group stage into the quarters, into the semis, into the final, more and more people started flying out. So, you know, I was lucky my family had been there the whole time, but suddenly brothers and sisters and boyfriends and girlfriends and all, all flying out. Um, and I think even Unzi's boyfriend flew out just for the final. So, um, so yeah, so no, it's a pretty epic party afterwards with all of them. Oh, I can imagine. I bet it's the biggest party ever. And actually for them, I bet they would yeah. have been kicking themselves if they weren't there in person when they could have been. If you yeah, exactly. Been, I'm sure they would have made that same decision again. But um, I, I, I feel like I wouldn't be doing this justice. Can you please tell everyone what Kathy Twig did in the Olympic final? She won the, she won the battle in the stands. Let's just say that. Go on, take it away. Oh, she'll be mortified on bringing up this story again. <laughs> yeah, she's gone. She's going viral through this story. It's fantastic. God, well, I mean, the twigs were a nightmare. Bobby Twig was on crutches. <laughs> I think Charlie had his top off at one point, and Kathy Twig was having a fight with one of the Dutch parents. Oh, I love it! <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so, no, well, for those that don't know, um, she was saving some seats for some of the GB parents, and. Uh, one of the Dutch players, sister, sister, I think it was, um, said that she couldn't, she couldn't save the seats and uh, it had to be for the Dutch, Dutch fans. And, and then it all got into a bit of a tussle and, and she, she then brought up the, well, and then I think that it was said, well, Dutch are gonna, going to win anyway. And she brought up the European final. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like, Georgie Twig doing her job on the pitch, winning those battles. Kathy <laughs> in the stands, also repping for the Twig family. I mean, I can just imagine it now, and it's brilliant. Yeah. I, the story never. Gets <laughs> um, I hope I hope Kathy isn't too mortified that you uh, shared that. But anyway, moving on to obviously after Rio, um, I can imagine your life must have changed hugely. Not just obviously being an Olympic champion, but as well in terms of how your career's uh, gone on over the last couple of years. So just a bit of background. So since retiring from international hockey, you've completed your legal practitioner course and qualified as a solicitor at one of the international leading law firms in the world, Bird and Bird. Now, looking back since you retired and obviously playing your last international game in Rio, what would you say is your proudest achievement since then? It's a, it's a really, really tricky one. I think, um, you know, I think for me, as you've said, I kind of always making sure that I was ready for life after sport was really, really important to me whilst still playing. Um, and so I was very lucky that I kind of knew what, what I wanted to do and was able to kind of have that set up for, for when I stopped. Um, so I think, you know, having a, a, a good transition out of sport was obviously um, something that that went very well and, and obviously you know I'm pleased that I was able to, to do that um, but I think probably as you said I think do you do your training contract after you know for the first two years when you start your job at a law firm um, but then and then I qualified into the commercial sports team at Bird and Bird and so I probably say that's that's my proudest moment since then because you know it's kind of been that journey you know the, doing the degree years ago you know balancing it alongside hockey then doing my LPC and then then training contract and so now sort of having been through all of that and, and qualifying into the area that I wanted to and something that I'm genuinely interested in um, is definitely something that, yeah, I'm proud of. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible, really. I mean, you've gone from strength to strength in every aspect of your life by the sounds of things. But in terms of your role now, you mentioned that you're working in the sports team. Um, do you think that obviously your background in, you know, being an international hockey player has kind of helped that transition into the team? I think, I mean, it obviously has no um, relevance as to whether I'm a good, a good lawyer or not. Um, but, but obviously, you know, having a, a genuine interest in the subject area and a knowledge about, you know, what our clients do and what they're going through. Um, and, you know, when, when we kind of come into contact with clients and stuff, and then obviously having the sporting background, you know, then meeting sporting clients um, has its advantages. Um, but, you know, I think there's also a whole other side to, you know, 
being a being a good lawyer as well so um so yeah I think it definitely does help a little bit particularly in the area that I've, I've now qualified into yeah I mean you must know your stuff to be obviously a qualified lawyer but truth be told okay no lies here have you ever dropped the tag you know Georgie Twig MBE Olympic gold medalist etc etc <laughs> <laughs> definitely not no don't think it's going down very well oh I know do you know what I think I always I go the opposite the opposite way I remember because I started I started at Burn and Bird five days after we landed off that plane from Rio wow. so it was and then I'm you know I'm part of a trainee cohort so I almost sort of went the other way of like never mentioning it whatsoever oh my gosh you would have been the most popular person around <laughs> no. no. <laughs> you didn't bring in your Olympic medal like show and tell or anything like that. No, I think um I remember I was going to an event like one evening quite quickly after after Rio and uh, the my the supervising partner I was sitting with was like, Oh go on, give me a show. <laughs> <laughs> so I quickly like got it out and showed it to an odd, an odd. <laughs> I mean I think you're missing a trick if I'm being deadly honest I would be you know I mean this is I'm absolutely clueless when it comes to law and everything else like that but I think you're missing a trick not that you obviously need the help because you're flying high at bird and bird but yeah br bring it out wheel and deal you know <laughs> bring out the Olympic medal every lab that you go to and everything like that but it's good that you're keeping busy and and from the sounds of things you, you're excelling in that in that career that you've taken but in terms of looking forwards now you're obviously you take up a numerous different ambassadorial roles you're part of the British athletes um uh, BA no BOA athletes commission you're yeah. part of well so you've got you've got so much going on and not to mention of course you you're still playing your club hockey at Surbiton and and setting the uh, England Hockey League alight but what, what's next what what kind of does the next you know say five years uh, look for in terms of your plans and ambitions do you think uh, I, do you know what I, 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 don't, I don't know to be honest I think um, it's very easy when you're playing sport to have these sort of set targets and goals um, and I think it's slightly different when you get into the the working world um, particularly in in a career like mine I just know that I'm kind of constantly developing now I'm you know I'm still learning um so so from a, a career point of view I just kind of knuckling down and and kind of just wanting to learn more and and progress you know keep progressing at, at what I'm doing at the moment um so yeah so there's not really you know it's kind of that's the sort of career side of things um and then obviously, you know, try and keep keep playing at Surbiton as long as, as long as possible. Um, but yeah, and obviously we're meant to get married this summer. So that's obviously, you know, hopefully going to happen next summer. So, um, so yeah, you know, it's just kind of getting on with the next stage of, of, of my life really. Yeah. I mean, don't, like talking about your, your, um, your time at Bird and Bird and, I mean, I'm not really too sure. I don't know whether anyone else watching will be too sure. But in terms of, you know, the career progression, would that be remaining in the sports team or would you look to explore other avenues within Bird and Bird? No, so what once when you qualify, you qualify into a department. Um, and so now I'm kind of, so the first two years you rotate around and then now I'm in the, in the sports team. Um, so it's sort of, yeah, your progression is just, sort of moving through associate levels um and then obviously partnership is a very very long long way away um but that's I guess that's probably if I was to stay at Burn Bird that would probably be the ultimate goal well I, I, I who do I need to speak to I'll, I'll make sure it happens <laughs> I mean they'd be stupid not to make you partner of course you'd be bringing out your medals as well <laughs> <laughs> Well, you mentioned Surbiton, of course. Now, I I have the absolute joy of playing with you um, on a weekly basis when, you know, I'm not injured. But um, it's always, it's a running joke in the Surbiton team that you've still got it. You're still, you know, you're still by far one of the best, if not the best players in the league. And you're always clearing up everyone else's uh, rubbish on the pitch. But would you ever look further down the line in terms of, continuing to play for certain and remaining to be involved in hockey for as long as possible 
think as you know, as long as I can keep playing to the level I'd like to to be able to play at, um, and I'm you know, then yes, I will be will continue. But um, you know, I still really really enjoy it, and actually really like that I can still manage to do that alongside my job. Um, and you know, so as long as as that kind of all that balance works, um, you know, I really hope that I can can continue to play and stuff. Um, but you know, we'll have to we'll have to see. <laughs> we have to have you still playing. That's, that's, that goes well. We need you back. Um. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But I mean, I don't think I've ever asked you this question, and I'd be really intrigued to hear what you said. But in terms of you know, you see lots of different um, athletes in every sport, really. And and once they retire from, you know, elite sports, say, they tend to stop playing. And, and for yourself, obviously, you're probably one of the minority that has actually carried on playing since retiring from international hockey. Did that ever go through your, through your head that you were going to um, stop playing and, you know, hang up? No, I, I know. I, I know exactly what you mean. But, um, no, not really. I, you know, I've always, I love playing sports. So, you know, as a kid, it wasn't necessarily hockey. I loved everything, um, you know, and it was all, and I love team sports. Um, and, you know, if I felt like I was sort of past it and always getting injured or anything like that, then maybe I'd start to, to reassess. But, you know, when, when I finished at Rio, I, you know, still felt like I, you know, you could still play and perform for the first team um and, and I really you know as you know we've got such a great group of people at Surbiton you know an amazing coach um and you know so I still really love it and so actually it, it never even crossed my mind that I was going to stop once I retired internationally no it's really interesting and it's music to my ears of course but in terms of obviously the next five ten years time by the sounds of things you're going to have your hands full just as much as you are now and keeping busy both you know, at Bird and Bird, but also on the hockey pitch. Um, I'm wary of time, and I've got another few questions to ask. So oh the God. previous two series of Cuffer and Natter have been done on Instagram Live, so I've been able to get lots of different questions from social media, which has been amazing. Help me out big time. But this series, I've got a quick fire, fun fact question round for you, okay? You might know the answer, you might not, but we just roll with it, okay? Okay. Question number one, how many times did you win the England Hockey Young Performance Player of the Year award and in which years? I think it was four. Correct. <laughs> and it was four. It was definitely 2010, 2011, 2012. So was it it's one either side? I don't know. Was it? 2009? Oh, no! Oh! So well, honestly. Yeah, winner of it four times in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. That's incredible. Did you feel a bit, um, you know, formidable in that, in that period of time? I went with 20, 2009 because I thought I'd be too old in 2013, but clearly not. Oh, you were around for a long time, girl. That, <laughs> that proves it. Very impressive, very impressive. Okay. You started well, okay? Question number two. According to the England Hockey website, so just to warn everyone, this might not be accurate, <laughs> but who has the most amount of combined England and Great Britain caps, yourself or your fiancé, Ian Lewis? Do you know what? This is a difficult one because I love... He didn't start, he started in 2011 for England GB. So he had a shorter period of time playing, but we used to have loads of games uncapped, whereas the men had more games capped. Mm. But then he was also injured quite a lot. So I'm going to go with me. I mean, if England hockey website is correct, you are correct. Very yeah. Cool. yeah, of course. I mean, I could be very wrong, okay? And Ian, if I've got this wrong, I do apologise. But according <laughs> to the England Hockey website, you had a total of 156 caps. Incredible. Ian, 146. Oh, it was close. And if he wasn't injured the whole time, you never know. Yeah, yeah. Also, if they counted the number of practice games that you guys played, I'm sure you would have been through the roof. 
Okay, <laughs> not a bad start. Okay, I've got another one. Again, yeah. to the England Hockey website, so I apologise in advance. Who has the most amount of combined Great Britain and England goals? Yourself or Ian Lewis? <sighs> Neither of us were big goal scorers. We've <laughs> uh, been double figures, so that's better than me. Oh, okay. I would, mm, I'm going to get again, go with myself. You know what? You can thank me later because I've given you a big ego boost right now. You scored 12 goals, Ian 11. Oh! Bragging right to you. I feel like he should be on dinner duty for the next week after watching this. But um... You know what, though? He gets, he gets the points for the best goal. He had, some, he had some crackers in his time. I mean, he did have a few worldies, but, you know, yeah. just don't lie. Um, and and you are the winner but okay i've got a more reliable source this time okay mm -hmm. according to a guy that goes by the name of kappa and a statter colin oh. pike himself <laughs> okay colin pike is an absolute legend at serpton hockey club by the way everyone how many league appearances including playoffs have you played for serpton since joining in september 2012 well, I've definitely crossed the 100 mark. That's correct. Mm, I'm going to go 120. Oh, my God. Okay, what? guys, Georgie Twig is a lawyer. Of course, she's going to be good at these sort of games. Oh. 126. That is a very what? good guess. That oh, was good. Yeah, you're, you're too good at this. You're running my game. You're supposed to be rubbish. It's, not, it's a bit sad, though. <laughs> That is a phenomenal achievement, and hence why you are a Surbiton legend. Okay, <laughs> final one, okay? Again, according to a couple and a statter, Colin Pike, and also he gave himself that name. I wasn't <laughs> created in Love it, love it. To get, but anyway, he helped me out. How many goals have you scored for Surbiton since joining in 2012? I actually have no idea on this one. Like, no idea. Um... 20? Yeah, I mean, you, you're going in the right direction. 29. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's more than I thought, although I've been there quite a long time. It's a solid shift. And for everyone else, you know, if you, if you notice, whenever Georgie Twig is on um, the score sheet with a short corner goal, it's usually because she's called the call. <laughs> wherever, wherever, that is not true. Wherever the ball goes. But, yeah, 29, that's solid. That is a good effort. I mean, yeah, I'll take that. I'll yeah. take that. <laughs> oh, all in all, I think you've done yourself very proud in that. Uh, fun fact, quick fire round. And I'm very wary that I promised you 30 minutes and you're a very busy person. So, Georgie, you're, on the, clock, you're on the clock, Em. Yeah, so sorry. I mean, I, I don't know whether you've still got to do some work after this. I'm bird and bird are going to be ringing me, being like, where's our main girl? She's too busy having a natter with me. But no. 30 minutes is nearly up. My mug of tea is empty, but all I can say is thank you so, so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure to have a natter with you. No, thank you, Em. It's been great. Oh, no, thank you. And for everyone else, thank you very much for joining us. The next guest will be revealed on Wednesday at 6pm, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, but in the meantime, keep that kettle boiled, keep natter and using hashtag cuppa and natter, and I'll see you again, same time, same place on Thursday. Thank you so much, Twiggy. No worries, thanks. Bye. Bye.